Marinero, the sick podcast brought to you by Cherry River. Hard seltzer, only 90 calories, natural flavors, no preservatives. Now available in Quebec grocery stores and at the beer store. We're talking Habs. The Montreal Canadiens played their first game in 12 days and it resulted in a 5-4 OT loss in Tampa. Joining me for this one today, Jared Book of Habs Eyes on the Prize. What's shaking, brother? Not much. How are you, Tony? I'm doing very, very good. Hey, listen, I got to tell you something. As uh, someone who hasn't always enjoyed myself watching the Canadians play this season, uh, as someone who actually wanted them to lose their share of games because no pain, no shame, I actually liked the way the Canadians played yesterday, playing with a decimated lineup, a depleted lineup. They had nine players on the COVID protocol going into the game. Make that now 11 today, by the way, because Paul Byron and Caden Primo were added earlier today. But so many young players, so many American Hockey League players getting the opportunity. You have a chance. You cover them for a living. You have a chance to watch a lot of Laval Rocket games. I got to tell you, I like what these kids brought to the table last night. What do you tell me? Yeah, I I mean... It was a matter of, you knew that if they had the opportunity to do something, they, they can show it. And, and you know, we're going to talk about uh, all the guys that got called up, but Lucas Vedamo, I mean, he's probably deserved a call up in the last two years, really, uh, just playing really good hockey. And, and you see the kind of mentality that they have in Laval, just work hard. They're not the most skilled team, and they're definitely not the most skilled at the NHL level either. So they just work hard, and, and the result is what you get. And the, the result was it was a fun game to watch, and, and there hasn't been many fun games to watch this season for the Canadians. So I guess it's improving from that regard. You talked about working hard, and that's what J.F. Hull, their head coach, has tried to instill in them at the same time. They don't really have much of a choice, right? They don't have slam dunk home run hitters. Uh, they, they don't have those kind of players down there. No, you know, uh, Joel Bouchard, the, the former coach in the Rocket, used to say that it, you know, if the guys were, were really good, they wouldn't be in the AHL. They wouldn't need the AHL. So you're going to have people who are not perfect players who fit maybe a specific role. And and that's, you know, they get called up and, and that's what they're what they're doing. You know, look at a guy like Raphael harvey Pinard playing on what is basically the second line for the Canadians. He's not a scorer, but he just works hard. He he plays the way that you want uh, you want to see players play, especially someone his size. And, and the result is, is that he scored his first NHL goal. But, yeah, I mean, that's that's what you have to do at the AHL level. You you watch the AHL, whether it's, you know, Laval or, or many other teams, they don't have those top prospects necessarily. And and so you have a bunch of guys who are just need to work hard to try and get to the next level. And that's that's what they have been since Joel Bouchard took over. J.F. Houle has the same kind of mindset. And, and you're seeing the results when they come back up to the NHL. You talked about Vedamo. He opened the scoring just under 11 minutes into the game, playing on a line with Paquette and Pazetta. The line was working hard. Pazetta threw a puck in front. He, there he was, just all alone, was able to tap at home. Right place, right time, hardworking line, hardworking players. They got it done. Yeah, you know, Lucas Vedamo is, is kind of like a Arturi Lekkinen light. You know, you can put him up and down the lineup. You can put him at center. You know, Lekkinen doesn't play center, but Vedamo is, is a natural center. And you could just play him, you know, in Laval, he's played everywhere from the fourth line to the third line to even top line. He played power play, penalty kill. He's not going to blow you away with skill, but he just works hard. He's in the right place. And he's just the kind of guy that, that coaches want to have. You know, he's very coachable. He, he's very smart on the ice. And, and what you're seeing there is this guy who can just play fourth line minutes. And Montreal has been struggling to find guys to play fourth line minutes this year. And Vedemo has just been, kind of been in Laval playing very well. And I was ha- very happy to see him get called up because I think he's deserved it for a while now. Let's say the Canadians part ways with an Arturi Lekkinen before the deadline. I don't think they will, but let's say if they would, because I think there's a lot of players that have to go before him. Uh, is Vedemo a guy who could be as defensively responsible as Lekkinen, who I think that part of his game is vastly underrated? Yeah, I, I don't know if he's necessarily as good as, as Lekkanen is. I, I think Lekkanen is probably elite in that regard. I don't think Vedamo is there, but, but Vedamo is very good. Like, he's he's like, if you call Raphael harvey Pinard the, the, the AHL version of Gallagher, then Lucas Vedamo is the AHL version of Arturi Lekkanen. He's, he's very good. You can stick him on the penalty kill and not worry. I'm not sure if he's necessarily as good as Lekkanen, but he's definitely someone who can fill that kind of role or, or even complement 
uh, Lekkinen because yeah, like, like you, I don't, I hope he's not traded either. But yeah, I, I think Lekin, uh, Vedemo is, is definitely an NHL player in in a specific role, and and I think that he's going to be able to show that. I mean, he scored in two straight NHL games. Yeah, I know he really has. 20, you know, twenty twenty. <laughs> Raphael RV Pinard showed me something actually before he even scored the goal in the game last night. He showed me something while he was on the ice, and he actually got scored on. If you take a look at Braden Point's goal, I think it was his first of two goals. I think it was Kulak who tries to keep the puck in at the offensive blue line, and it gets knocked away, and all of a sudden, it's Braden Point taking off the other way. Raphael RV Pinard is giving everything he has in tracking back and trying to get to uh, to, to Braden Point. I think Paling actually even takes his stick and, and tries to give Raphael RV Pinard a push from behind to try and propel him forward even a little bit more. But you take a look at the way he tracked back, and I know that um, Braden Point scored on the play, but he didn't give up. And listen, here's a guy who hasn't given up his whole career. He was drafted in the seventh round, 201st overall. And when they drafted him, I remember talking to Trevor Timmons about him and said, listen, we talked about guys being long shots once they're drafted in the second, the seventh round and 201st overall and all that stuff. And he said he, he plays with a lot of heart, he plays with a lot of passion, enthusiasm. Uh, he's an extremely hard worker. He's a very proud player. Don't bet against guys like that. And you know what? Um, he wasn't drafted his first time around, and he gets his opportunity, and he plays his first NHL game, and he scores his first NHL goal. And Jared, on that play, he did all the right things. He went to the yeah, net. He got positioning. He kept his stick on the ice. He redirected a puck. He scored a big goal to tie the game at two once the Canadians were down. Two to one after Braden Point that scored a couple of goals. Yeah, you know the, the thing with Rafael Harvey Bernard is he's not he's he's a smaller player obviously, and he's not the most skilled player. So you know he's not going to get away with being a run and gun style player. He has to round out other parts of his game, and and that's what he's done in Laval. That's what he did even his last couple years in junior. He was scoring, but he was also working on his defensive game. He won. Um, he won the Memorial Cup with, with Ruin Randa and and I think that that's just the kind of player he's become. And, and I think a lot of people are maybe surprised at how good he was right away in the AHL. Uh, I, I think that there are a lot of question marks around him. And and I think that, you know, he's just a guy that you mentioned it. He just works hard. And, and he know, could he be a late bloomer, team. too. Someone who gets Absolutely. better as he gets older. I mean, he's going to be 23 years old in a couple of weeks if memory serves me well. Yeah, I mean, look at a guy like Michael Pozzetta. You know, a year ago, you, you would I, if you would have told me that Michael Pizzetta would be an NHL player a year ago, nothing against him, no disrespect, but I would have believed it. And, and Rafael Harvey Pernard, you know, maybe he's rushed into an NHL spot a little bit early because of the situation that's going around the Canadians right now, but he didn't look out of place. And, and I think that that's just a testament to, you know, we mentioned development in a negative way around the Canadians a lot, but... I think you know, you look at the results of these guys coming up yeah. in the AHL and, and you can't necessarily look at it in a negative way anymore. You know, these guys are coming up and, and working hard and, and not looking out of place. And I think that's, you know, a testament to, to the system behind them as well as much as it is the players themselves. All right. So now speaking of development, let's take a look at a couple of players who spent some time in Laval, Cole Caulfield and Ryan Paling. Paling spent more time than Caulfield did, who of course, I, I think Caulfield played six games or uh, seven games this year with Laval, and that's about it. But Paling spent quite some time on that goal by Clagg. I have to tell you, the way Paling picks up a pass from Caulfield, the way he drives the middle looked like a player with a lot of confidence and looked like a player, looked like a player, period. Yeah, you know, Ryan Paling, you know, going into last season had a lot of questions to answer. And I needed to see more. You know, you, you look at a lot of people compare Paling to Jake Evans, right? First round pick. Kind of like when we pick. get home at three o'clock in the morning. There's a lot of questions <laughs> to answer when we get home, eh? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. And, and that, that's the whole thing with, with Ryan Paling. He had questions to answer because he was passed on the depth chart by Jake Evans, which, you know, as a first round pick, you don't want to necessarily see that. And he, had, he, he never dominated the way that Evans did at the AHL level. So what did he do last year? He became a true number one center in the AHL. And I think that that confidence, you mentioned the confidence, it really carried forward. And this year he went to Laval, he didn't sulk, 
He played hard. And what does he do? He gets called up. He had a little bit of a rough start in Laval in the NHL this season. But I think that he's... I would be very surprised if he went back to Laval at any point in his career at this point. I think that he's become an NHL player. And you see, you know, the, there was a part of the fan base and, and maybe even the media as well who was looking at Ryan Paling as a failure of development. I, I don't know if you can call it that anymore. He's definitely developed. And, and you know, th- there was a lot of people who... Who have talked about you know Joel Bouchard and how he you know dealt with players and things like that and JF Hool in a short time, he got Ryan Paling back to the NHL and credit to Ryan Paling he he's made himself an NHL player. Development goes both ways. It's yeah. not only coaching. It's not only a player. It has to be a mix of both. And, and I think they both deserve credit because Ryan Paling is is looking like I don't know if he's going to be a top six player in the NHL like he is right now on this depleted roster, but he's an NHL player, and, and I think that that's a testament to him, and, and it's a good news for the Montreal Canadiens going forward. You know what last night showed, I think, uh, is not only that J.F. Hull has done a good job with some of these players in Laval. They get called up. They don't look out of place. They actually contribute. They play well. They work hard. It actually, it's a message to Jeff Gordon as well, I think, <laughs> Executive Vice President of Hockey Ops of the Montreal Canadiens, that should a rebuild or a revamp take place with this team and a couple of veteran older players are traded away. This team, if they bring up players from the Laval, they're not going to get humiliated. They're, they're going to work so no. hard that they're going to be in games. And clearly it's going to happen from time to time that because, you know, Nest, they won't have the talent to match up that. Yeah. They'll probably lose some games by two or three goals or, or even maybe even four, but for the most part, you know, they're not, they're not going to get humiliated as much as they did when veterans were in the lineup. And I say this because if there's one thing that the game showed me last night, Jared, was that, and I felt this going into the season, by the way, every now and then I'm right. Doesn't happen often, but every now and then I'm right. Going into the season, I felt that with the Canadians having an inferior team on paper than they did in the Stanley Cup final, Stahl was gone. Hadn't signed on with any team. Perry left for Tampa. Deneau left for Los Angeles. Weber's unofficially retired. Byron's not there at the start of the season because he's got an injury. Edmondson's out with an injury. And then the second that Carey Price enters that player's assistance program, I'm thinking that there's a lot of veterans on that team, coupled to the fact that they went to a final, had a shortened summer, and the dejection of losing in the Stanley Cup final, I thought a lot of those veteran players, and some of them have long-term contracts to boot, I thought they were kind of going to be demoralized, not give their best, kind of pack it in and say, okay, you know what? It's just this year was not in the cards. And I felt that going into the season, and based on the way they played most of them, I still think that today. I think I was right in thinking that. And now these players come up from the American Hockey League and they're saying, you know what? I got to show what I can do. I want to try and get myself a next contract. I want to try and make it to the National Hockey League. I want to be a Montreal Canadian. If it's not with them, I want to prove to other teams and other GMs that I could end up being an NHL or one day, yada, yada, yada. And so they're working hard. And I think they're working harder than a lot of veterans that started the year with this team. Yeah, I, I think that what you're seeing is just they're raising the bar. And, and for so much time, the Montreal Canadiens didn't have that second tier. You know, they call up guys and they get sent down. And they, they don't really fit in. You know, even guys who were talented, like, you know, Charles Udall, he never really forced the issue. Matthew Pekka, I remember a few years ago. Yeah. They never really forced the issue. And they never really forced the coaching staff to leave them in the lineup to push guys out. And I think what you're seeing now is guys running with a chance. And, and yeah, I think that there's definitely issues with, you know, the, the mentality at of, of the veteran players. And, and it's not something that can't be corrected. I, I think that it's going to, you know, it's been a, a really rough year for, for a lot of people on and off the ice. And I, I think that seeing their teammates at Weber and Price dealing with what they're dealing with is, is not easy. You know, being so close and knowing that you're not as good as you were a year before. And, and I think that it even trickles down to the coaching staff. And, you know, I, I think that Dominic Ducharme kind of has the pressure off now. And, you know, you talk about AHL guys fighting for their next contract. Dominic Ducharme has a lot of people to impress if he wants to stay in the NHL. And, and I think that, you know, maybe having a simplified game plan, maybe having guys that, you know, are, are I don't know how to say that they're not listening to him, but having guys that are just playing 
as hard as they can, maybe that helps him simplify things and take the pressure off and, and not worry so much about the score at the end of the game, but how they look doing it. And, yeah. and I think that maybe this is something that will help the Canadians move forward and, and it'll definitely help Jeff Gordon make some decisions or and whoever the next general manager is as well. A shout out to sportbuffshop.com for all of your officially licensed sports apparel. Any player, any team, any sport, pick up the apparel there. And also our sick merchandise. Use code SICK15 for 15% off on all of their items. How do you like this beauty? Huh? No pain, no shame. All right. Speaking of which, a quick word on um, the draft and 2022 and Shane Wright and what you've seen so far. I don't know about you. But I'm willing to suffer for Shane. I'm willing to suffer even more for Connor Bedard. What a beauty, huh? Four goals versus Austria. Count them four. Um, the last 16-year-old to score a hat-trick for Canada at the World Juniors was Wayne Gretzky back in 1977. And Connor Bedard becomes the youngest player uh, at age 16 and a half to score four goals for Canada at the World Junior Championships. If we thought Shane Wright was good, Jared, this guy's another level. This is a generational talent. Yeah, you know, 2023 is turning out to be uh, some kind of year. And, and I, I know that Crosby and Ovechkin weren't in the same draft class. Yeah. But, but it, it's it's really hard to, to not see the comparisons to um, Ovechkin and Crosby when you look at Mitchkov and, and Bedard. And, and, you know, obviously there's the contract right. with, with Mitchkov in, in the KHL. But I, I think these guys are going to be two of the, the, the top players in the league for a long time. And it's rare that you get to see that so early. You know, even... You know, Russian players, you don't see those guys at 16 years old in the World Juniors. It just doesn't usually happen. And and I think that it's, it, it, you know, a lot of the talk in the first couple of days of the tournament was about Michkov, the Russian, and, and what he did against yeah. Canada, what he did in the first early games. But, man, Connor Vidard really announced his, 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 his arrival as well. And I think that yeah. you can't really go wrong at the top of the draft. And, you know, you mentioned uh, the, the guys in Laval and, and working hard to, to make a spot in the NHL. And, you know, maybe, maybe this, maybe 2022 isn't the year that you're, you're going to start to rebuild or finish the rebuild. Maybe it goes another year. And, and I think that that's something that the Canadians, I think have to look at, but I, I don't I like, know whether they're necessarily, you don't, you don't build to lose t games, but, but I yeah. think you have to have an eye on that. Don't you? I, I love his maturity, by the way. It's unbelievable. I mean, we're talking about a 2005 born, I think June or July is his birth date or whatever. Uh, so he's 16 and a half years old. It's absolutely amazing. He's playing at an under 20 tournament. Uh, it looks like he's the most talented player there out of all of them. It's really, really amazing when he says, you know, anytime you're in the company of one of the greatest players of all time, it's always pretty cool. But then he went on to mention, I don't think I'll be getting 2,800 points in the National Hockey League. I just, he's very, very humble. He's obviously very skilled, very talented. Uh, he's got a nose for net. He's got a wicked wrist shot. I mean, that play yesterday when he tucks the puck in and then that wrist shot into the top of the net was amazing. Okay, in ending, let's end it here on the Montreal Canadiens. Um, Brendan Gallagher thought it was a goal. Dominic Ducharme thought it was a goal. It was waved off. They go to the coach's challenge and uh, the, the officials come back and say, no, no, <clears throat> no goal. Dominic Ducharme says at the end of the game, if it's not Brendan Gallagher, it's a goal. Did the referees make the right call? Did the league make the right call or... The people upstairs, did I, they make the right call? Yes or no? I'm going to say no. And the simple fact is, that's like, how, how could you not want that kind of goal in the game? Right? Like, it, 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 regardless of precedent and, and things like that and yeah. who it was and, 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 you know, time in the game, if you watch that play, how can you tell me that that's not a goal that you want to have? I mean, we're, it's a league that's looking for scoring. Yep. And you're taking goals out like that. It, it just, it doesn't really make sense to me. And and I think the World Juniors, the double IHF have it right. You know, you look at uh, when Mitchkov was pushed into the goaltender yep. and, and the puck went in, they ruled it a goal because he was pushed in. And I think that the NHL needs to have that same kind of leeway when it comes to, is the player there because he actually went in or was he pushed? And, and you look at that play and where, what is Gallagher supposed to do? No you know, Jared, for me, <clears throat> it's very simple. <clears throat> Pardon me. Gallagher was pushed. So at this point, is he able to not interfere with the goalie? At the end of the day, the only person that knows is Gallagher. Gallagher knows if he could have avoided the goalie. Gallagher knows if he intentionally interfered with the goalie. So at this point, 
It's the benefit of the doubt. Whether you give it to the player or you don't, Gallagher comes with a reputation. They didn't give him the benefit of the doubt. I don't know if it was a goal because, once again, only Gallagher knows. But I tend to agree with Ducharme's statement that if it's another player and not Brendan Gallagher, they're probably calling that a goal. So, unfortunately, his reputation precedes him. And, you know, if he's going to be a Montreal Canadian long term, think about that when you think of the next captain of the Montreal Canadiens because the captain of any team has to have the attention and, more importantly, the respect of the officials and the referees. And I'm not so sure Brendan Gallagher has it as much as he would want to have it or as much as he should have it because of his reputation of crashing the net and making life very, very difficult for the opposition, especially the opposition's goalie. Jared, always fun talking to you. I'll talk to you again, most likely in the new year. Happy New Year, bud. Have a good one. Happy New Year, Tony. He's Jared Buck. I'm Marinaro, the Sick Podcast. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at the Sick Podcast and our YouTube channel. Subscribe. It's free. The more people subscribe, the more money I make. Life is beautiful. Ciao for now. See you, Jared.